Good morning and welcome to Cornerstone Baptist Church. We're glad you're here this morning. If you would, please stand with me and turn to number 234 in your hymnal. And we'll start off the worship service this morning with Crown Him with Many Crowns. Please remain standing for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your many blessings upon us. Father, pray that uh, you would just bless this service. Please uh, uh, be with Pastor Morton as he brings your message. Please uh, let us all be, be touched by your Holy Spirit and uh, maybe uh, take what he preaches home and apply it to our lives. Uh, thank you again for all that you do for us. We love you and thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, if you would turn over to number 220, he lives, we will sing all three verses. I serve a risen Savior, he's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hands of mercy, I feel voice of cheer and just the time I need him he's always near he lives he lives Christ Jesus lives today he walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way he lives he lives salvation to Hearing 
will come at last. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He You may be seated.
let's look to the Lord in prayer for our offering. Dear Lord, we thank you for allowing us all to gather together today, this Sunday morning, that we can come and worship you and sing praises to your name. We ask your blessing now as we take up the offerings and the tithes, that we would uh, use them to further your work here in Lawrence, as well as supporting our missionaries around the world, that we could see your gospel spread and shared with those that need to hear it. We ask that you bless the sermon, the sermon from Pastor Morton, fill him with the Holy Spirit, and open up our hearts to what you would have us to hear. Uh, we pray these things in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. If you would stand with me one more time and turn to number 289, we will sing all four verses. And at this time, children are dismissed for Children's Church. There shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing sent from the Savior above. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing, precious reviving again. Over the hills and the valleys, sound of abundance rain. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. Verse 3. There shall be showers of blessing, send them upon us, O Lord. Grant to us now a refreshing, come and now honor your word. Showers of blessing, showers 
a blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing, oh that today they might fall. Now as to God we're confessing, now as on Jesus we call. Showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. Thank you. You may be seated. And now the Fitzsimmons have a prayer for, for us. Sometimes when life seems gentle and blessings flood my way, I turn my gaze away from you and soon forget to pray. But when the sky grows darker and courage turns to His voice cries upward with words you long to hear. Lord, I need you. When the sea of life is calm, oh Lord, I need you. When the wind is blowing strong, trials come or cease, keep me always on my knees, Lord, I need you, Lord, I need you. Lord, help me to remember I'm weak, but you sing apart from you, for Lord, you are my song. Although I'm prone to wonder and boast in all I do, Lord, keep my eyes turned upward so I depend on you. song. That was really good. And good morning. Good to see everybody here today. Welcome to Cornerstone Baptist Church. If you're a first-time visitor, uh, we're so glad and honored that you're here. If you're a return visitor, we're glad that you're here. If you're a church member, we're glad that you're here. I'm just glad to be in church tonight. This morning, aren't you? You're glad to be here this morning? I am too. Looking forward to God's uh, word being shared and open this morning. If you would, take the Bible and turn with me to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 and we'll look at the first two verses together. Luke chapter 10 and verses 1 and 2 is where we'll, we'll, we'll jump off from. With the Lord's help, especially with the missions conference coming up on us this week, later this week, uh, I want to preach on this thought, challenging our hearts with the harvest that we have. And 
here's the title of the, today's message is Our Great Harvest or The Great Harvest. And I want to look at it in the, in the scripture here and uh, challenge our hearts to get us thinking about souls as we're approaching our missions conference. Looking forward to a great week together. And uh, Luke chapter 10 and verses 1 and 2. If you're there, say amen. amen. All right, good. Let's look at it in verse number 1. The Bible says this, Luke chapter 10, verse number 1. The Bible says, after these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place, whither he himself would come. Therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. We'll pause and ask the Lord to bless our time together this morning. And would you pray uh, for me and with me as I pray right now. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the word of God. Uh, without it, we'd be lost. Without it, we wouldn't have a clue what to do. And I thank you, Lord, for the word of God. And you've given it to us in a language that we could read and understand. Perfectly preserved, just the way you want us to have it, Lord. I pray that you would just bless and uh, reward the, the preaching of your word, Lord. The word of God, exalt it and magnify it. Do a work in our hearts through it. And we're so thankful for each and every person, every family that's here this morning, Lord. Man, what an honor it is to have them. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you today, Lord. And I pray that you would just hide me, your messenger, behind the cross. Get me out of the way and help us to leave here having heard from you this morning. Challenge our hearts through the story here, the word of God here. Uh, to have a a soul uh, consciousness this morning, that we have a heart and a burden and a passion uh, for giving the gospel out and reaching the lost world around us. And I pray that you would just be magnified and glorified. I pray that you would receive all the praise and honor uh, from what's said this morning. And dear God, I pray that if someone here today that does not know you as their Savior, if there's someone here on the property today that doesn't know for sure That if they were to die today, God forbid, but if they were to die today, that that they would not be sure of heaven. I pray that you would just even now begin to speak to their heart. Go down to every aisle, go to every pew, every heart this morning. Speak to our hearts and draw us to a point of decision. And I pray that you would just lead them to making the greatest decision they could ever make. And that's choosing to accept you as their Savior. And I pray that you would just... uh, be, be honored and glorified in everything that's said and done. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The great harvest. Uh, look at verse number one, those first three words. It says, after these things. There were some things that happened before Luke chapter 10. In chapter uh, 2, we see it at the age of 12, 12 years old, Jesus was reasoning with the doctors and others in the temple. The things of the Lord and things of the scripture at 12. Chapter 3, we see Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. Chapter 4, we see that Jesus actually withstood the devil's temptation after being 40 days without food and water. He did it with the word of God. Chapter 5, Jesus was busy healing the leper and the palsied man. Chapter 6, we see that Jesus chooses out the 12 apostles and even reproves the Pharisees. Chapter 7, we see that uh, Jesus heals the centurion's servant. Chapter 8, Jesus uh, calms the storm, casts out legions of demons out of the maniac of Gadara. And in chapter 9, we see that Jesus uh, raised up Jairus' daughter from the dead. He calls his 12 disciples together. And he gave them power and authority and then sends them out to preach the gospel everywhere they went. And then he would go on to feed the 5,000 plus women and children. He, then he would go on to be transfigured and he heals a lunatic man. Jesus, did, he, Jesus was busy. If you can't see that in scripture, Jesus was busy. He devoted his life and his ministry about getting the gospel message out and to help people and heal people. He was busy. This brings us up to where we're going to be today in Luke chapter 10 and verse number 1. Let's read that verse together again. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. 
Jesus even chose. He knew that, man, I need, I need people to help me if we're going to reach the harvest. Jesus calls the 12 disciples. And with Jesus and the 12 disciples, many great things were accomplished. So much had been done with Jesus and his 12 disciples. But Jesus knew that there needed to be more labors if they were going to reach everyone that needed to be reached. And so, in chapter 10 and verse number 1, Jesus calls other 70 along he and the 12 disciples. There was 82 disciples plus Jesus. That's a lot of people. I mean, think about it. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of soul winners. That's a lot of follow-up visitation people and a lot of disciples. But this is the picture I want you to see. Jesus with the 12 calls out 70, so there's 82 of them there together, and he sends them out, and these, uh, these 82 men are sent out two by two, and they're walking away, and Christ is looking at them, walking away, headed to the, the cities that he called them to, to, to reach and minister to, and this is what the Lord has to say. Look at it with me in verse number two. Therefore said he unto them, Christ speaking to those disciples he just sent out, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are, what's the next word? Few. Even with 82 men that he just called out and sent, the Lord knew the harvest. He is the Lord of the harvest. He knew the harvest that these men were sent out to. It was a great harvest. It was many, many, many souls that needed to be reached. And Christ said, the harvest truly is great, but the labors are few. I want to take the words of our Lord and Savior this morning. The harvest truly is great. And I want to preach on that thought, our great harvest this morning. He alone did so much. He healed so many people. He reached multitudes. And uh, then he calls out 12 disciples to help him reach this harvest. These 12 men that he called out, his personal disciples that he personally called out, well, would reach thousands, would lead many to Christ. They would, uh, they would uh, help the sick and cast out demons. They did so many great things. In Luke chapter 9, verse 6, in Luke chapter 9, verse 6, it, it tells us some of the things they did. And they departed and went through the towns preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. These 12 disciples were busy. They were busy preaching the gospel and helping people and sharing the truth with people. But Jesus saw that the need was great, that he needed more laborers to come alongside these 12 if they were even going to make a dent into it. Now with these other disciples, now 82 of them, they would be sent out and they would be empowered and commissioned to preach the gospel and this group would then go out and do many great things for the cause of Christ. They would ac accomplish so much. But even after all their accomplishments, Jesus addresses the need for more labors. The more labors. Jesus, I believe, was addressing a need that he had in his day that is still a need in our day too. And that need is for more labors. That need is for more labors Labors to go out like the disciples and like the 70 and like Jesus Christ that would get busy reaching the harvest, the great harvest for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm looking out this morning at Cornerstone Baptist Church and church members that have been here for years and years. And I look out across this auditorium and I see faithful laborers that have spent decades and decades reaching people with the gospel of Christ, sowing the gospel seed in this community, and discipling those people, and bringing them to church, and working the bus route, and working Sunday school classes, and doing so much labor for the Christ. All that faithfulness of God's people through the years, knocking doors, working a bus route, and still, I believe the harvest is still great today. So much in 43, soon to be 43 years, so much has been accomplished through this ministry, Cornerstone Baptist Church. The souls that have been reached, the people that have been married and sent out and are now serving the Lord, so much have, has been accomplished. But do you understand this morning, the harvest still is great this morning. The harvest is still great. The city has only grown since 1979 when the church was started. The city has only grown, which means the harvest has gotten bigger since 1979. 
The laborers who faithfully plowed for years and years, the ones that we just talked about, are physically no longer to, able to do what they once was, once were able to do. Some saints were, have even graduated on to glory. So we already know the harvest has only gotten bigger since 1979. And we already know that a lot of faithful laborers that have sown and reaped the harvest for years and years have passed off the scene. Where does that leave our church today? It leaves our church with the greatest harvest that there's ever been and fewer laborers. There's a need this morning for laborers, God's people, to get a burden and a heart for the harvest. A burden and a heart for, for the harvest that our Savior, the Lord of the harvest, has. And what, what do we mean by the harvest? The harvest this morning that I'm talking about is the lost souls. The lost souls that we see in Lawrence and Indianapolis and McCordsville. I was told I said it wrong. It's not McCordville. McCordsville, okay? And then Fishers and Carmel and Greenfield and Fortville and abroad. The lost souls that are around us. And that's the harvest that I'm talking about this morning. It's, it's the harvest is the people across the street. It's the people, it's that the people that you call neighbors next door to us. It's our own families and our own loved ones and maybe our own spouses. It's our co-workers and yes, even the drunk on the street. The souls, the harvest that I'm talking about. Our harvest is not only the souls that are in our community, but the harvest, speaking of, of, uh, of our missions conference coming up. These flags represent a, a, a spot around the universe that represents a harvest that's there. South Korea, the Bahamas, and uh, Japan, and all these other places. It represents a harvest, not just down our street, not our harvest that we as a local New Testament church have, a, have been commissioned by God to reach our harvest. But I'm talking about the harvest that's around the world too. The harvest that's the lost souls that are around the globe. The lost souls that are across this ocean, in the bush of Africa, and even in the jungle in the Amazon. It's talking about souls that need to know Jesus Christ, your Savior. So what do we do? I mean, what do we do to reach our great harvest? Well, here are some truths I believe that will be helpful uh, in, in challenging us to reaching our great harvest. The harvest that we could reach. Number one, here, here it is. Number one, we reach our great harvest by being serious about the Great Commission. We reach our great harvest by being serious about the Great Commission. Look at it with me in our text, Luke chapter 10, and look at it in verse number 3. Luke chapter 10, verse number 3. What's the first word? Say it loud, church. Go, go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. This job, this, this commission, this calling, if you will, uh, that God gave those disciples, it was a serious task. Well, Pastor Morton, how serious was it? He's telling them, I'm sending you out into a bunch of wolves that are out there in the world. That's a pretty serious thing. That wolf reminds me of how serious the devil takes his job in disrupting the cause of Christ and disrupting us as laborers to reaching our harvest. Wolves. He says, listen, I'm sending you out there and you, if, you're gonna, if, if we knew we were going to encounter, I don't even know what, what they're called, a pack? Is it a pack of wolves? A pack of wolves. We would take that seriously, wouldn't we? I would take every gun that I own. I'd take every gun that I own with me. We'd take it seriously. And the devil is an adversary that should be taken seriously. The Bible says that he's a roaring lion that walketh about seeking whom he may devour. That's our adversary who takes his role in disrupting the cause of Christ seriously. And we need to take our job as laborers reaching the great harvest seriously this morning. It's a serious task. There are literally people, souls, souls that hang in the balance. The Bible talks about us being those that our job is literally pulling them out of the flames, the Bible says. we got to take our job seriously. There's people that if they do not hear the truth of the gospel message and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ will spend an eternity in hell. Am I in a church that still believes that this morning? If we believe that, if we believe the Bible is true when it says those that die without knowing Christ as their Savior will spend forever separated from God in hell. If we believe that, shouldn't it compel us to take our job as laborers seriously? Seriously. Great commission, that word commission, we've heard that before. 
I looked up the, de- the de- de- dictionary definition of the word commission is this. An authorization or command to act. It's a command to act in a prescribed manner or to perform prescribed acts. When God commissioned those 70, he did not give them the great suggestion. It was not the great, you just decide if you want to be obedient to it or not. Do you know what a command is? It's a command that should be obeyed. We think about command in the sense of a military. You know, if your commanding officer gives you a command to do something, he doesn't say, you know what, uh, we're going to go invade the army now, invade the enemy now, all right? But you can stay and sleep in if you want to and stay behind. Where's Tim at? Where's Tim at? If, if your drill sergeant or commander told you, gave you a command, what would you do? What would you be wise to do? Do it. Obey it if you know what's good for you. And if we know what's best for us as God's, in God's army, we're his soldiers and laborers, we just need to be obedient and do what our commanding officer, the Lord Jesus Christ, tells us to do. What is that? Go. Go. Go your ways. That's what he commanded those 70 uh, disciples to do. We're told in verse number 3 to be serious, serious about our task. We need to be serious enough about being the laborers in the great harvest that God's calling us to be that we have a, a heart for. I want you to see in Psalms chapter 126. If you would turn there quickly, Psalms chapter 126, and look at it with me in verses 5 and 6. The Bible says this. We're talking about being serious as laborers in God's harvest trying to reach our harvest, how serious should we be about it? We're serious enough to take our adversary, the devil, seriously. But we're also serious enough to go sowing in tears, the scripture says. Look what it says in Psalms 126, verses 5 and 6. The Bible says this, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. I'm telling you what, how serious should we be about reaching the harvest, reaching our families that are lost that make up that harvest, reaching our loved ones and reaching our spouses and reaching our children and reaching our grandchildren. How serious should we be about it, Pastor Morton? When's the last time you prayed so hard and you were so broken and so burdened for your lost loved ones? You're so burdened for your, your family to be born again that you prayed and begged out to God and you went sowing in tears. Sowing in tears. I'm telling you what, I'm, every, every night we, me and my wife pray for the salvation of our children. That's something that's pressing on our hearts as parents. We want our children to know Jesus Christ is their Savior. I'm telling you, we take that seriously. If you have a serious burden for a loved one or a neighbor, a co-worker, somebody that you know that needs to be saved, when's the last time you were just so burdened for them that you went so with bearing precious seed with tears? That, that precious seed that we're supposed to be sowing is the seed of the gospel. Like Pastor Mitchell was talking about this morning, we should do good to other people and we should try to show them the love of Christ and do good to other people, but there is no greater need that someone has than knowing Jesus Christ is your Savior. When you're doing those acts of kindness and when you're showing the love of Christ and doing things for people, make sure you don't deprive them of their greatest need, the gospel. Number one, we reach our harvest by being serious about the Great Commission. Number two, we reach our great harvest by being organized with our approach to the Great Commission. By being organized with our approach to the Great Commission. The gospel never changes. The gospel should never change. It's the biblical gospel. It's by grace through faith. But we should be, we should be aware of, we can use different approaches like we have a fall festival, I hear. I hear y'all, y'all did a fall festival. That's wonderful, and that's probably a great thing to help the community. But guess what? I'm sure the gospel was given out on the, on the fall festival. We have uh, different ministries that we have. We have a Christian school. It's a ministry. It's an outreach of our local church, Cornerstone Baptist Church. We don't just have a heart for education. We have a heart for reaching those children with more than just subjects in school. But we have a heart for reaching those children with the gospel, the gospel message. 
the approach can be different uh, based on your community. We have uh, Hispanics in our community. One approach to getting the gospel out through our church is we've started a Spanish ministry to reach, have an approach that's designated for the area that God has us in with a lot of Spanish folks. The approach can be different, but the gospel never changes. But he, look at this. Look at it with me. This, I thought this was interesting. In verse number one, look at it with me in verse number one. We see, I believe, an organized, an organized approach the Savior had to reaching every city and reaching every place. If he just told the disciples, all right, guys, just go out there and then just figure it out on your own. No, he set them up for success. He, he organized them. He called the 70 together. And just to make sure that uh, 30 of them didn't go to the same place and five of them didn't know what to do, he organized them. Look how organized the Savior was with his approach to reaching every city and reaching every place. Look at it with me in verse number 1. The Bible says this, After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his, place, for his face into every city and place, whether, uh, whither he himself would come. So he, he, um, he sent them, he sent them, he sent them in a direction. He gave them his authority and commissioned them, specifically two and two, and then in every city, in every place. He organized them to where they would get the job done the most efficiently. I'm telling you what this describes to me, this describing an organized approach to getting the gospel out, that sounds to me like our missions program. Our faith missions program is an organized approach to making sure the gospel is sown in every city, in every place that we can. It's an organized approach, our faith promised missions giving program here at the church. But also describes to me an organized church-wide soul winning time. An organized church winning soul winning program. They met they had a planned out area to reach and then were sent out with a partner to share the gospel. It was an organized approach to getting the gospel out. Number three, we reach our great harvest by being obedient, by being obedient to God's calling on our lives to partake in the Great Commission. Now, by being obedient, look what it says in verse number three. It says, go your ways. He had a purpose and a plan for every one of those disciples it wasn't just a select few of them. That group of, of 70 men were gathered there, and he said, go your ways. And it was just, oh, yeah, well, that's so-and-so's job, and I'm sure he meant go your ways. Yours is a relative term, so it's probably, he meant your way and your way, not my way, your way and your way. No, your way was a personal command that each and every one of them had to go their way and go get busy giving the gospel out. You know what they, were, what they were? They were obedient. They were obedient. They didn't try to make excuses of why he wasn't talking about them when he said, go your way. They were just obedient. God said, go, and they went. They were obedient. In Matthew chapter 28, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, the Bible says this, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And then in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, the Bible says this, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The command this morning to go is not just for the pastor or the pastor's wife. It's not just for the deacons. It's not just uh, for church staff. The, the commission, the great commandment for, for Christians to go into all the nations and to preach the gospel to every creature is for every living, breathing Christian today. That's the commission. The command is for every single one of us to share the gospel with everyone that we meet. Go ye, therefore, and teach all nations. The, the Great Commission is not just giving out the gospel. We see there's three parts of the Great Commission in Matthew 28. It says, go ye, therefore, and teach all nations, teaching them and sharing them what the gospel is. And then it says, what's the next thing? Baptizing them. 
The Great Commission doesn't stop with just leading them to the point of salvation, but it's to show them from the Scripture the importance of following the Lord in believers' baptism. It's not You're not baptized to be saved. You're baptized because you already are saved. You're showing everyone else, I'm not ashamed to identify with being a follower of Jesus Christ. It's like putting on the Christian uniform and not being ashamed of it. I'm going to be baptized because Christ was baptized, leaving me an example. It's baptized, but it doesn't stop there either, does it? It's teaching all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, and then teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. That's the discipleship part. The, 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 fun, the fun part, the, the most time-consuming, the most... Uh, the most tasking part of the Great Commission is the third step. It's the discipleship part. It's the discipleship part. Well, I, I led someone to the Lord, but I, don't, I haven't seen them come to church. Well, how active are we in discipling them? They don't know what we know, forsaking not the assembling of ourselves together. They don't know that. They need to be taught that. Church membership isn't something that old people do. Church membership and church involvement and church attendance is something that the Lord exhorts believers to do even more so as the return of Christ is imminent. But how are they going to know that unless someone teaches them all things? What, what is this whole thing about we have to tithe? Does all that money just get in a plate and get put in the pastor's bank account? No. We, we, we represent missionaries. We send missionaries across the world. And that money propagates the gospel. And that money helps us uh, operate the, the, the ministry here at the church, at Cornerstone Baptist Church. And it buys gospel tracts. And it, has the, it keeps the internet on and going. And it has a lot of things that we do with that money. But how is that person going to know that unless someone teaches them? I'm telling you what, we need to be people that are obedient to every part of the Great Commission. I want you to go soul winning and share the gospel. But I also want you and I to, to share them with them the importance of being a, a, a believer that follows Christ in baptism. But I also want us to be those that are willing to be the disciples that that new convert needs us to be. If I had Connor, and I even we're across the street, but my baby, if I put my baby son in, in, the, in the house there and we leave without him, and I say, Connor, church starts in 20 minutes, son. I want you to come across when you're ready and go to the nursery yourself and be there on time. You wouldn't expect a baby to be able to make their way to church without help. So why do we expect baby Christians to navigate the Christian life without help? We need to be the disciples that we need to be. And that takes effort. That takes work. That takes a special type of heart that if they don't have a Bible... It's, it's not just letting them know where they can find one. It's using your time, your resources, and your energy, and you securing one yourself with your own resources and giving them a Bible. If they don't have a ride to church, well, I'll give you the number to Uber. No, a disciple is one that will do anything to bring that disciple along in their faith. If that means me waking up half an hour earlier, and I will pick you up in our car, and I'll bring you and drop you off, that's what I'm talking about discipleship that we need in this church excuses christians make not going so on i'm not trying to be mean but these are excuses that i myself have made being transparent with you in my life before these are uh, excuses that i've heard many christians many christians make for not being obedient to the great commission number one i'm too tired i'm too tired I just don't have the i just don't have the just the energy i just don't have the i'm just exhausted i'm wiped out but we have enough money, and there's nothing wrong with these things. Don't get me wrong, okay? I do some of these things. There's nothing wrong with them, but don't use those as excuses, okay? I'm too tired, but we have enough energy to lift weights, go jogging, play sports, go shopping, ride bikes, et cetera, et cetera. Just be obedient and go, go soul winning. Well, I don't know how. I don't know how. So learn. So learn. If we don't know something, what do we do? We get our phone. Hey, Siri, teach me everything I need to know. We ask Siri to show us everything else that we, we need to know about something. We look it up. We go take the extra effort, and we look it up on the Internet. How do I change this part of my car? Uh, what do I do to get this uh, uh, license? What do I need? We look it up if we don't know. We have a phone, the world at our fingertips, the phone, and we look it up. We go out of our way to learn about things that we, we have a heart about. You know what? I don't know is not going to cut it because you can literally... 
you can literally take a track out, open it, and it's got enough Bible in there for you to read that thing word for word. Let me just tell you something. It has nothing to do with the soul winner's personality or dynamics that someone gets saved for. It has nothing to do with me being a pastor. It has nothing to do with you or I, period. We're just the vessels that God uses to work through us to give them the gospel. The power comes from the word of God. And we're supposed to be sharing it. And the Bible says the word of God's not going to return to us void. If you want to go out there, I don't know how to do it. Well, great. Take a track. Read it word for word to them at their door. I don't know how to, I don't know how to go soul winning. Share with them your testimony. Do you know what your testimony and my testimony is? Sharing with others what Christ has done for us. I'm telling you what, I may not have all the Romans road memorized. And by the way, there's not, there's not a, a, a one way to do it. A Romans road is just a, a neat way to put all the verses together. You could take someone to Book of John and show them how to be saved from the Book of John. D- don't get hung up on that. I don't know the Romans road, okay? Share with them your testimony. You should be able to articulate what Christ has done in your life enough that they hear about Jesus Christ. I'm telling you what, if you would have met Colin Morton uh, before two th- July 31st, 2011, I mean, I'd be embarrassed to introduce him to you. Uh, I, the Lord has changed my life, he's changed my desires, and he wants to change your life too. Share your testimony with someone. Everybody in here can invite someone to church. So you don't know what to do as far as showing them how to be saved from the Bible. Invite them to church where they can hear the gospel and then get saved. Share with them our YouTube and Facebook account. All the services are on there. Lead them to there where they hear the gospel. But just don't use the excuse, I don't know. I don't have time. I don't have time. I work. So does everybody else that's not retired. I just don't have time. Aren't you glad that someone that showed you how to be saved didn't use that same excuse? I don't have time. I'm afraid of rejection or negative experiences that come along with soul winning. Well, what if they slam the door in my face? What if they say, I don't want to hear it? What if they're rude to me? What if they... Bless our hearts. Bless our hearts. Tell that to Jesus who was literally rejected by the very people he came to to save. Tell that to Jesus who did not stop through the rejection, through the beatings, through the anguish. He went to the cross so he could make a way for us to be saved. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't stop when he was rejected? Let rejection stop him from doing what was necessary to provide salvation for you and I. Rejection. That doesn't stop us from applying for jobs, does it? How have you applied for a job that you didn't get? But you still went out and applying jobs. I didn't get the job. I got rejected. I'm just not going to work ever again. No, you brushed it off and you went to the next employer and applied there. Rejection doesn't stop us from from dating. I've been rejected before. My own wife rejected me first. That's a whole different message in itself, okay? I'll tell you about that later, okay? We all suffer some type of rejection, but it doesn't stop us in doing secular things. Why should that stop us from doing the most important thing? The, the work of uh, the gospel, getting the gospel out. You listen, we got to remind ourselves too, they aren't rejecting you and I. They're rejecting the Savior that we represent. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7, Samuel was offended. I'm telling you what, Samuel was heartbroken. Here he is, a man of God who's devoted his life to serving these people. And look what he says in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7, the Bible says this, And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people, in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Samuel got offended. They want a king? Was I not judging right? Was I not being what they needed me to be? They want a king, so they must not want me. And the Lord's reminded, reminded Samuel, like I believe he can remind us this morning, listen, he's not rejecting you, Samuel. Hey, Christian soul winner, When they are mean to you and you have a negative encounter with someone, they're not rejecting you. They're just rejecting the message that you're sharing with them. Number four, we got to hurry. Number four, we reach our great harvest by being faithful to the Great Commission. By being faithful to the Great Commission. Look at it with me in Luke chapter 10 and verse number four. The Bible says this. Carry neither purse nor scrip nor shoes. And this is the phrase that stuck out to me. And salute no man by the way. 
that stuck out to me. I'll tell you why. I get, don't worry about packing your bags. This is an urgent mission. So leave everything. You just take what you have on your body and you just go your way into every city and every place. But why would the Lord tell them not to salute anybody that you come across on your way? You think about that before? You're going your way to the city that you're supposed to be going to and someone stops by and says, hi, how's it going? The weather's, weather's pretty hot, isn't it? You're not even supposed to stop and talk to them and salute them, chat with them, fellowship with them, hang out with them. I believe this. I believe the application could be this, to be focused and faithful on the task at hand. Don't get sidetracked with talking about fish and how the fish are biting and the weather and politics and everything. You have a mission to do. Don't let anything keep you from accomplishing the mission. And as a soul winner, I don't know if you've ever uh, knocked on someone's door and you're talking with them and you get busy talking about everything else under the sun. We need to be reminded we have a job to do. It's not to find out what favorite team they have and talk about sports for an hour. It's to reach their soul for Jesus Christ. Now, I understand about breaking the ice, okay, using something to make a connection with them, breaking the ice, and then going into the gospel. But our main duty there is to preach the gospel to them and for them to get saved. Here's another, here's another example of this, being faithful and focused on the job at hand. How many of you have ever, speaking with someone, they chase some try to random rabbit trail? I've had this one before. Hi, I'm from Landmark Baptist Church, my home church. I'm just out inviting people to church. Um, do you go to church anywhere? Oh, no, you don't go to church anywhere. Great. Oh, uh, well, more importantly than going to church, if you were to die right now, would you be 100% sure that you'd go to heaven? Oh, Landmark Baptist Church, uh, your pastor was a race car driver. Yes, but what about my question I ask you? Oh, you're, you're the church that has the Christian school, right? I heard that you guys don't take... Okay, yes, but can we get back to the main thing? Man, people will try to get you off track when you're at their door. But we have got to be focused on getting the gospel message to them as best we can. Now, number five, we've got to hurry here. I'm going to spend time on the last one, and we'll wrap it up. Number, uh, number actually, number, number four, right? Five, all right, number five. We reach our great harvest by being thorough with the Great Commission, by being thorough. We are not car salesmen, okay? I'm never going to tell you just to rush through the plan of salvation with somebody and just to get their name on a card, rush them through a prayer, and run off from them. We've got to be thorough. We've got to be thorough. A lot of people struggle with their eternal security, knowing that they're saved and getting it settled because we're just rushing through the process without taking time to be thorough and explain it to them answer questions they do have about uh, salvation and what comes next and things like that. We're not just rushing through it. Got to be thorough. Notice with me how thorough the disciples were when giving out the gospel. They were focused. They would not get distracted. They had a job to do. They got it. They went to the job. They were faithful and focused, but they, they were thorough. Look at it with me in verse number five. Luke chapter 10, verse number five, the Bible says this, into whatsoever house ye, what's the next word? Enter. First say, peace be to this house. And if the son of peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. And in the same house, what's the next word? Remain. What's the next word? Eating and drinking such things as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. I don't believe when the, when the Bible says go not from house to house, he doesn't want us to go to every single house. The principle is, if you are in someone's house, you've stayed there long enough now that it's supper time, is the, is the thing that I got from it. You're not just, uh, one, two, three, repeat after me, next house, one, two, three, repeat after me. You're thorough enough about it to sit down with them if needed and answer questions. Oh, it's dinner time. Let's continue to talk about this through dinner time. Oh, it's dessert time. Amen. It's dessert time. Let's stay through dessert, and let's start talking about any questions you have through dessert time. It's they were thorough about it. Now, I would not encourage ladies especially to go inside anyone's house, okay? The principle is, however, thorough. Be thorough. Take your time. Never paraphrase Scripture. Always take time to read the Scripture verses. 
Nothing that I say is more important than what God and his word says, okay? Be thorough enough to take them and not just, you know that verse about Jesus' love in John 3, 16. Take time to read them the scripture because that's where the power comes from. The power comes from the word of God. So take time to share with them the word of God. Don't just rush through it. Man, if you have to, start with Adam and Eve. Give them a context of how sin entered into the world and death passed upon all men because of one man's sin. But then just after the line, the, the seed of Adam, there was the seed of the Savior that came along and met the needs of, of that sin problem. And he solved that and, and, and went to the cross of Calvary and shed his blood and take them through the verses and be thorough about it. And the last one is this and we're done. We reach our great harvest by boldly doing the Great Commission. By going out with boldness. With boldness. Look at it with me in verses 10 and 11. Luke chapter 10 and verses 10 and 11. But, but into whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you not, go your way, ways out into the streets of the same, and say, Even the very dust of your city, which cleaveth on us, we do wipe off against you, notwithstanding, be ye sure of this, that the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. That takes a lot of boldness. If they reject the gospel that you share with them, he told these disciples here to go into the middle of the street, get a crowd of people around and shake off the dust off your clothes and saying, this is what God's doing to you. Since you've rejected the gospel, God's, God told me to brush it off, dust it off and keep moving. That takes boldness. That takes boldness, and we are commanded to go out in a spirit of boldness when we're trying to reach our great harvest. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 6 says, So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Ephesians chapter 3, in verse number 12, it says, In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. There's a boldness that comes from knowing what we're sharing with someone is the truth. There's a boldness that comes with that. There's also a boldness in going up to someone's door that you don't know and talking to someone in the supermarket that you don't know from Adam or Eve. It does take boldness. But I'll tell you what, when we go, we're not going alone. We have the, the indwelling spirit that goes with us that will give us the words to say and will bring things to our, our remembrance in 2 Corinthians 3.12, the Bible says this, Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Ephesians 6.19 says, And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. I'm telling you what, when we go out, we need to go out with boldness, knowing that we have the truth. And we have the answer to all of people's spiritual problems, the gospel. And we need to go with boldness. There's a boldness that comes from rescuing people. In Jude chapter 1, verse 20, 23, the Bible says, And others, saving with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. And then in 2 Timothy 2, 25, In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and I want to I want to conclude with this in conclusion we reach our great harvest by praying to the Lord of the harvest that he sends us labors that we need I'm telling you what when we when we talk about Having families come and people come and couples come and, and families come. All people, we want people to come into this membership and join our team. It's not to just put a number on the attendance board. But do you know why we need to grow this local body of believers? It's because I understand our harvest is great. It's going to take laborers to reach our harvest my heart in asking people that have been coming to consider joining us. When I, I'm asking people to, to consider if this might be the place that God would have you to be planted and start growing, it has nothing to do with you just being here for being a number. I know that if we're going to reach the great harvest that surrounds us, we're going to need every labor that we can get. 
let me just share with you some ways our harvest is great. How great is our harvest, Pastor Morton? Well, in the world, these are probably wrong. These are probably a couple years old statistics. There's estimated 7.5 billion people in the world. There are 880,000 plus people in Indianapolis. There's close to 50,000 people in our backyard of Lawrence. Third, 332 million people in the United States. Folks, our harvest is great. Our harvest is great. How are we going to reach it? By reaching one soul at a time. By just reaching one soul at a time, reaching as many souls as we can, and then bringing them to a point where they follow the Lord in baptism. Bringing them to the point where they join the local church and start growing, discipling them. And then they make a disciple. Who makes a disciple? Who makes a disciple? Who makes a disciple? That's the formula that God's given us to reach in our great harvest. It's to reaching souls, bringing them to the place where they can reach a soul, bringing them to a place where they can reach in a soul. And it's just a, it's just a, a process, a cycle. How are we going to reach our great harvest? It starts with the people in this place this morning having a heart to reach it. Do you have a heart and burden for reaching the great harvest? Your family that's a part of that great harvest? Your neighbors that are a part of that great harvest? Your coworkers that make up that great harvest? I pray that you do this morning. If, you could have, if I could have every head bowed, every eye closed. What do you need more laborers for? Well, if we're going to start and build back up the bus ministry, that's going to take laborers. Someone that needs to kind of oversee and direct the bus ministry, that's going to take laborers. Buses don't drive themselves, to my knowledge. That means we have laborers for bus drivers. We're having a vacation Bible school. That's great, Pastor Morton. That's great. We need to minister to children. We're going to have a vacation Bible school. Wonderful. That takes laborers. Sunday school teachers and Sunday school helpers, it's more laborers. Soul winners and uh, more children means more laborers needed. We have more babies join the nursery. That means more nursery workers needed. We have more younger families. That means we need a, a laborer to start a young married class. Older saints that can't do what they once did. We need someone to minister to them and to help them with yard work. And uh, Spanish folks, that means more laborers, more missionary, more laborers. That's what it needs. That's what we need. So here's my three questions and I'm done. Would you prayerfully consider joining this church if God's given you peace to do that so that you can join this team of laborers and help us reach our great harvest? So you can plug in and grow and then help others. Would you follow the Lord in believer's baptism? Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Preacher, I've been saved. I know it. I know that I'm saved, but I've never followed the Lord in believer's baptism. Man, I'm telling you what, that's the first step of obedience that follows salvation. It's taking that step of obedience. What about this? Would you pray and get your life right so the Lord can use you to be the laborer that he needs? Whatever God's spoken your heart about, as the music begins to play, and Brother Walter Meyer leads in a song, just be obedient to it. If you're here and you need someone to show you from the Bible how to be saved, Pastor Morton, you spoke a lot about the gospel. What is the gospel? What is the gospel that someone believes in? The death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Believing and placing your faith, not acknowledging facts. There's people that acknowledge the fact that God must exist, but faith is a dependence alone in Jesus Christ to save you. It's coming to the end of yourself. Stop trying to work your way to heaven Stop trying to attend enough church services to go to heaven. Memorize enough religious steps to go to heaven. Coming to the end of yourself and placing your faith and dependence in Jesus Christ alone. Repenting and trusting Christ as your Savior. If you've never done that, you are a part of the harvest that we at Cornerstone are trying to reach. If you're here today and you don't, don't know Jesus Christ, your Savior, 
There's never been a, a, a time or a place, not the exact second, but there's never been a personal encounter where you realize that you were a sinner. You've transgressed and broken God's law, and you, knew, you know there's a punishment for that. Punishment is eternal separation from God in hell. But then someone shared with you a wonderful message that God loved you so much that he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to die in your place and mine. Pay for all of your sins, past, present, future. And all he requires of you to be saved, have your name written down in the, in the Lamb's Book of Life, and to know that you're going to heaven when you die is to trust him and believe what God's word says he did for you. If you can't remember that kind of encounter with God, you need to be saved. On the authority of God's word, you need to be saved. You are not going to heaven. That's not my opinion. That's what God says. You need to get that settled this morning. As the music plays, whatever God's led you to do, would you do it? We have an altar here. Steps in the front. You don't have to pray at the altar to be right with God. But this is a place that's opened up for people that God has spoken to to come and get things right and do business with God. In the Bible, things were slain on the altar. There were sacrifices that would end their life. In the New Testament, we see that Christ wants a living sacrifice. This New Testament altar is where we can lay down our lives and give him a living sacrifice. Would you do that? If you would, please stand with me, and we'll sing and have the music play. If God's spoken to your heart, would you step out from where you are and come down to the front here? Meet me. If you're a man, I'll come down here and take a Bible and show you how to be saved. If you're a woman, we have ladies down here in the front that can show you from the Scripture how to be saved. Would you do it as we sing and play? stop just for a moment if there's someone here that you you know when we're talking about the harvest and lost souls there's someone the lord brought to your mind would you take it upon yourself to reach that part of the harvest yourself some way gospel track invitation to church just being the right kind of christian in front of them that you need to be just have a heart for whoever the lord brought to your heart and mind for me it's my brother and my dad I, I think about how great heaven's going to be, but I want my, my whole family to be there in heaven with, with me one day. If God's laid on, your, laid on your heart someone that you have a burden for, would you pray that the Lord would use you to reach them? As the music plays, some have already come forward. As the music plays, we'll do one more verse of invitation.
much. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we still have someone here at the altar. If you would have a seat, I'll read a couple announcements to you, and then we'll be dismissed. Um, the, I was given this. Teenagers, there's an overnight youth rally at Indian Creek Baptist Camp, May 6th through 7th. The cost is 35 bucks per person. There's going to be games, snack shop, food, and preaching. If you're interested or know somebody that's interested, please see uh, Mr. and Mrs. Pointer. And then we have the Isla's Wedding Shower is May the 7th at 11 a.m. And we have the gift suggestion sheet in the back of the lobby. What? Okay, at the, at the desk in the lobby. And then make sure you grab one of those and uh, see what you can do to help them out. April 6th, this week, this week is coming up fast. This Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then Sunday, April 6th through the 10th, is going to be our missions conference. Each night at 7 p.m., if you can make it, be here. It would be a great time. We have missionaries from Italy, uh, Brother Fitzsimmons, and then also a, a missionary to our military going to be here each night presenting their work. It's going to be a great, great night. Wednesday, April the 6th at 5.30, we're going to be having an international supper time with our missionaries that Wednesday. So if you can be here, please bring something international-ish, and then uh, we'll have a good time. All right, and then, let's see. Oh, we got the... We got the missionary bulletins back there. Make sure you grab some of those. And then also, there was questions about, are we having a service on Saturday? There's no service, missions conference service on Saturday. We are still having a men's prayer breakfast, but we're just going to bring the missionary men in there with us. So just, just to avoid any confusion there. Um, let's see. Easter service is the 17th. Make sure that if you're wanting to eat after the sunrise service at 7 a.m., you sign up in the back and then bring some money to donate to the teens that are helping with the breakfast. And then our Easter cantata, a special musical uh, Easter program, will be April 24th. Looking forward to that. And then continue to pray for us as we're looking for different ministry position needs in our school and assistant pastors. So just pray for that. Um, anything else I missed? Any other announcements that I missed? Yes, sir. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. So not this Sunday, but next Sunday? Okay. So there's a snack attack Sunday night after church. Teens are having a snack uh, party fellowship uh, next Sunday after church. I want to thank you. If you're a visitor with us today, God bless you. Thank you so much for being here. And um, if there's anything we can do to help you, be a blessing to you, please let us know. And we're looking forward to being back tonight at 6 p.m. So we'll go ahead and be dismissed in prayer. And then we'll see those that can make it back at 6 o'clock tonight. Um, Brother Pointer, would you dismiss in prayer, please?